Um, so uh, we'll start with um, uh, Ben Cowling, who's the head of the uh, Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Hong Kong University. Um, and we just to talk to us a little bit about some of the non-pharmaceutical interventions and situations uh, for preventing respiratory illness and, and also um, in the context of kind of communicating that and engaging people around that. Thanks very much. Yep, good morning. Are you ready for me to talk now, Heidi? Yes, please. Okay, sure. So for non-pharmaceutical interventions, these are the kind of measures that we can do that don't require medicines or vaccines. In general, in respiratory virus epidemics or pandemics, we'll think of these interventions as maybe emergency measures, but not the kind of thing that we're expecting a permanent change uh, for the rest of our lives. For example, with face masks, we may be asked to wear face masks for a short period of time, not for the rest of our lives. Uh, things will change if vaccines become available or if we figure out some more sustainable way to, to deal with the virus that, that we're, we're troubled by. Now, if I could put it very simply, the, the major measures that we have available in a respiratory virus epidemic or pandemic are things like masks, better ventilation, and staying away from each other. Um, and I could, I could actually split all, all, all the kind of measures that have been used in the past year for COVID and the measures that have been used in previous epidemics and pandemics of respiratory viruses into two categories, targeted measures and community-wide measures. The targeted measures are things like isolation of sick people. We've also seen for COVID uh, some places in the world using quarantine of exposed people who may or may not have been infected to try and get ahead of transmission. Targeted measures are really kind of really good because they can just disrupt the, the people who are either infected or exposed without disrupting so much other people in the community. But they need a lot of testing. You need to know who's really infected and who's not. If you just use uh, maybe syndromic definitions, syndrome definitions, it's going to be tough to figure out exactly who should isolate and who shouldn't. And there's also issues with equity and fairness about uh, if people are supposed to stay at home and isolate, who's going to pay for, for their loss of income and so on. So that's targeted measures, which I think are really valuable. And something like staying at home when sick could be one of the most important measures in the next flu pandemic. And figuring out how to make that feasible and, and equitable and so on would be really, really important. In terms of the community-wide measures, there's a lot of the things that we've seen in the past year. Mass masking, cancelling mass gatherings with large groups of people, reducing crowding indoors, whether it's restaurants or shops or other places, school closures, working at home and so on. In my opinion, reducing the three Cs, uh, that's from Japan originally, reducing the three Cs has been one of the best public health messages. It's so clear and so generalizable. It applies in a lot of different situations and settings. So here are the three Cs. First one, avoid closed spaces with poor ventilation. Closed, that's a C for closed. Second one, avoid crowded places with many people nearby. Again, it's similar to closed spaces, but the emphasis is on lots of people being in the vicinity. And the third C, avoid close contact settings like close range conversations where you're really having that prolonged close contact with other people. If we can avoid those three Cs, particularly multiple Cs together, we can do a lot of good. And, and I think that's helped a lot in Asia, particularly and around the world with COVID-19. Now, my last point. In terms of differences between COVID and other respiratory infections, for me, the main one would be the role of children. So for most respiratory infections, whether it's flu or common colds, children tend to be the most susceptible to infection and the most responsible for spreading infections in the community, more so than adults. So that means that interventions like school closures would be really a valuable intervention to have uh, in the pocket ready for a really serious flu pandemic. In a mild pandemic, hopefully not needed, but if it's a really serious respiratory virus epidemic pandemic, then school closures would really be high on the list. And I think we've got to learn from the experiences in the last year about what worked or didn't work with schools dismissed, uh, half days, Zoom classes and so on, and being fair to children so that they they don't lose out so much. I think there's been, there's been uh, some maybe good aspects and some bad aspects of the school the, the school measures in the past year. And we've really got to take a good look at which of those uh, uh, can be taken forwards, ready for the for the next epidemic or pandemic. So that's that's my opening comments. Back to you, Heidi. Thank you. 
Sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much. That's fantastic. And I can see why they put you on a communication panel because you are uh, quite articulate. I love the C's. Uh, you can throw in avoid avoid contagion. <laughs> um, but that's that's great. Um, and I think the the role of children has been really important. I mean, I my background is more with with UNICEF and immunization, childhood immunization. And I remember the incredible impact that childhood um, pneumonia vaccination had in reducing um, uh, transmission in the older population. So I, all great points and uh, well said. Thanks so much. Um, I'm glad to see we have uh, Sarah and Priya who have joined. Um, Sarah Zong is a writer at The Atlantic. I'm sure many of you have been following her writing as, as I have very um, as, as much as I can. Um, and Priya Bari, who's the scientific principal scientific officer at the European Medicines Agency. And uh, Priya has been uh, doing a, um, a huge task of editing a volume that recently came out on communicating about risks and the safe use of medicines, real life and applied research, which has been quite a quite a journey and and um so i look forward to both of your your comments i'd like to throw out a, a general uh comment um and we just heard a bit from ben but the context of to to sarah and and priya um in the context of preparedness and even in the thick of outbreaks as we are in um, what have you seen is important in conveying, communicating critical information? What's worked for you? And, and also, we have this challenge of constantly evolving communication. Maybe I'll start with uh, Sarah. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Heidi. And thanks to everyone for having me. I'm really glad to be here this morning. Um, so I guess as the journalist, I, I, I talk a little bit about how I think about the role of journalism and the role of media. And I, I think I would say, um, just on the outset, I don't necessarily think that the role of the media is to convince people to, for example, get vaccines, but rather to convey information. And, you know, when the information is there, like that can actually have that effect. Um, you know, the, the question was, what have we seen worked? And I think actually one thing that's been frustrating for me and my colleagues, and I think maybe others on this panel could speak to as well, is the feeling of, um, well, a lot of things haven't worked, right? Like, especially in the U.S., we've seen kind of wave after wave of COVID and the same thing happening over and over again and thinking, well, what can we do <laughs> that will get the message across this time that they did not the first time? I do think there are a couple of things that, um, you know, as, as a journalist, as someone who interfaces with the public, I feel like I've really managed to make stories break through. I think one is just um, specificity and emotion in the story. I'm thinking back to, um, you know, this is kind of the pre-vaccine world, but I'm thinking back to the run-up to the holiday Days, uh, when it was very clear that there was going to be a lot of travel, and that there was also going to be another huge surge of COVID. Um, how do we get across that this is bad and this is bad in a way that is not the same that it was in the summer? And one of my colleagues, Ed Young, wrote a story about a very specific hospital in Nebraska, one of the best prepared pandemic hospitals in the U.S., um, and just the utter exhaustion of the nurses and the doctors in that specific hospital. I think that story really broke through in a way that uh, it would not have if we had just said like doctors and hospitals are overwhelmed again, right? It was the very specific characters, very specific names and the kind of very specific emotions that they were conveying. Um, of course, this can also backfire and thinking about in the terms of vaccines, a, a story that will stick in your mind is a story of someone getting sick, right? Um, you know, allergic reaction following a vaccine. That's a very vivid story that will stick in your mind, but that's also not representative of uh, what is a typical experience. Um, and I think so much of what's been difficult in communicating is that the story of COVID is in some ways a story of very, very large numbers and the story of very, very small numbers. And these things are just so, so abstract for the human brain to comprehend. Hand, you know, how do we even think about hundreds of thousands of deaths or a risk that is something like 0.01%? These are um, really, really hard to, to grapple these like changes in magnitude. Um, I think something that's been really effective is really data journalism is to kind of visualize these changes rather than just saying numbers because uh, just, you know, even when I hear a barrage of numbers, I can't really make sense of actually how big of a difference 10x or 1000x really is. Um, 
And again, I think some of the really great data journalism I've seen has kind of conveyed, for example, why even a risk that is small to you individually can apply over to you know, millions of people can still accumulate to many, many more COVID cases. An example of this is I think uh, 538 had a visualization before Thanksgiving of what it meant for you, know, you as a single person to have Thanksgiving, the risk is not that high for you as a single household, right? But if you if you multiply this by millions of households, you're talking. We actually are talking about hundreds of thousands of cases, and that is in fact what we saw with the third surge. Um, and I think maybe one more point I would make is uh, just a little bit of humility, which is that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to kind of be representing the media here, but uh, if we were having this panel 50 years ago, the media would have been kind of your uh, biggest like uh, interaction with just speaking to the public, and that's just uh, no longer the case, right? Uh, social media is just where so much, somehow people get information now. It's also where so much disinformation spreads. And I think um, a lot of the times when we're talking about communication, we need to be thinking about not just what is the media saying, but in fact, what is happening out in this wide world of social media? And I think there have been some, you know, really creative things done here, but um, uh, there's just a little bit of humility that I realized that the media is not the be all end all in this conversation. Great, uh, thanks so much. But to your to your important point, I do think sometimes we get so focused on social media that we forget the 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 you know critical role of of mainstream media and in some parts of the world still um i mean we just did a big study in in africa and uh, tv is the primary one and in parts of west africa radio so um it's still there still has a huge influence in people's lives so um thanks uh that was really important points um on the emotions and the specificity um, I see we have uh, Shireen has also joined. I'll inter we have uh, Shireen who's with uh, Common Thread, a founding director of Common Thread, and I've already introduced Priya. So we'll start with Priya and then move on to Shireen. A, a bit on the same question of in the context of preparedness and the outbreak. Um, you've you've handled a lot with the area of risk communication, but I'd love to hear your thoughts also in your own broader work, but also in the context of uh, EMA, the European Medicines Agency, from a regulatory perspective. Thanks. Hi, thank you, Heidi. Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased uh, to be here on the panel. And yes, I'm happy to talk from a broader regulatory perspective within EMA, but actually also uh, a bit worldwide, as I um, have been working on two initiatives before. One uh, is the report from... Oops. ...from... Um, Sciomes. Sciomes is that's for vaccines, which can work more in real time. Um, and uh, during uh, this uh, initiative, we also looked at how to communicate results from such studies in public private partnerships in particular. And that was led by Heidi. I was the co lead. And, and for the science report, I was the lead. And the science report was actually also meant to support WHO's blueprint uh, for um, vaccine safety surveillance and uh, was in fact also very broadly applicable to worldwide. So from these perspectives, because both reports were also made very much up for regulators, I would like to, to make a few points. And um, I think what was specific in our both these reports was that we looked early on to uh, to implement a systems approach. And uh, there are three main columns for the systems approach, which is that we really need within regulatory authorities also the capacity for communication and specific skill sets, but also these um, skill sets and the communication expertise needs to be woven in and interact with the safety surveillance and risk management processes. And I think this is still um, a, a very big challenge because two different perspectives, capacities, worlds come together and, and issue um, together 
communication to the public so that the integration of these processes um, is, is, um, is certainly something which deserves a lot of um, thought um, in both in preparation but also when, when, when we go and we need to adapt. And, uh, and the third column is the engagement with stakeholders, uh, and that would include um, the broad public, um, journalists, um, healthcare professionals, policymakers. Now, uh, what we saw is that um, there has been a, a paradigm for a long time that scientists or public bodies should speak like with one voice. Um, and, uh, but in reality, uh, that's actually not happening. And I think we have to, uh, to recognize, and that's also one of the important points that the advanced report is making, that each of the organizations has a different legal mandate. And with the different legal mandate comes also different communication objectives. And uh, for some organizations, there is also a restriction of what they can actually issue. For example, pharmaceutical companies, uh, depending on the jurisdictions, might well be um, uh, restricted to that they cannot say everything because it could be mistaken as, as undue um, advertisement. Now, when we look at the difference between public health agencies, which are responsible for the immunization programs and um, regulatory authorities being responsible for the benefit risk balance of individual products, we, we see that um, as a regulator, we are not communicating for um, I mean, our primary goal is to inform about the benefit risk is, is not uh, in, in, in general terms, we are not there to, uh, um, uh, to motivate people necessarily to take medicines of whatever kind of product, uh, because that is uh, then left up to the therapeutic choice of, of, the, diff of, of the healthcare um, system of the, of the individual. Uh, and, and the individual disease and the individual case. Now, in terms of vaccines, that's a more tricky um, equation because we, we look here also at population health and we are specifically now in a, in a situation of pandemic. But a priori, our, our focus is on empowering others to take well-informed decisions. So, um, so messages can or have sometimes to be different because of the different legal mandates but they, they still have to be consistent and we should at least speak the same language. I think there is a problem that different scientists use terms in different ways. Uh, let's say, for example, the term herd immunity as defined in many ways and used differently by different um, uh, experts or, um, or other terms um, equally, uh, 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 well, the public was maybe confronted with a lot of epidemiological concepts all of a sudden and uh, I'm currently also involved with another initiative at the International Network of, of Epidemiologists for Policymaking. And we are making a call that we need more epidemiological literacy out there in the public to empower people to, to, to make sense and also be able to, to spot um, good news and, and, and less good news or fake news. Now, um, so what has worked for us as regulator, um, as I want to give one example, um, there was a research project we did um, while we did an assessment of HPV vaccine a few years ago, and we engaged for the first time at EMA in, a, um, in an intense three months uh, monitoring of worldwide media, news media though, not uh, social media, news media, and uh, we could see a very interesting pattern. So while the assessment was ongoing uh, in the first few weeks, there were a lot of questions around, okay, so what safety concern is that? How many cases are there? What will the frequency be in case that is a real risk? Uh, it was about um, some neurological events which turned out to be not causally related, but in the beginning we didn't know. And then um, throughout, um, throughout the weeks, the, the questions changed. There were added questions around what methods do these regulators actually use? Um, are these methods robust? Um, is it, uh, how do they ascertain their cases? How do they calculate frequencies? They're underreporting. So it came all of a sudden a quite methodological um, questioning. And in the end, there came broader questions about risk governance, about how do we maintain um, public interest, uh, sorry, um, uh, avoid conflict of interest and maintain public interest. How, um, how do we govern um, 
the industry and so so then there were broader questions and with these themes which we had emerging we uh, we changed our communication strategy at the time by um, putting more of this contextualizing information uh, into our um, outcome documents on the assessment but also preparing our lines to take in new ways and much more intensive and and that really worked for us extremely well and um, the media office had very good feedback from from the journalist community and this is something we have then taken also into the pandemic now um, and what we've done here is um, we've done a lot of prep work even before the vaccines were yet uh, even the applications weren't yet submitted we already put out a lot of um, these generic information uh, on the methods on the risk governance as background information so we could quickly refer to and I think this is one of the things which worked really well um, now um, where we see challenges at the moment and I really hope and that's why I'm looking so much forward to the panel now is to actually see how it's the first time that as regulators we do uh, communicate out of ongoing assessments um, so previously we would announce the start of an assessment and then the end with the evidence but now there is a lot of pressure in between and that uncertainty and I think this will be a big question for, for discussion so I'll stop here and um, uh, thank you so far. Thanks very much, uh, Priya. That was really brought uh, yet another perspective. It was interesting, both uh, you and Sarah made the point um, that uh, not to be persuading people, but to basically be giving information so people have a an informed choice. And I, I think that's really an important um principle. Uh, I certainly have I've shared some journalist roundtables and I've, there's been a few times where I've seen kind of health authorities say, and you should do this first and you should do this. And, and they would say, we don't work for you. We're, you know, we are meant to, but we want to give whatever information that we can. And, uh, and it's a very, it's an important point, particularly in the current environment we have with, with publics wanting to own their choice. Um, um, now we'll turn over to uh, Shireen Gerges. Thank you so much uh, for joining me to bring yet another perspective. And that's um, uh, from the community, from, from the field. Uh, I, I always admired all the work you did around polio and now in, in common thread with a lot of your engagement and community work that, that will bring another perspective for us. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the context of outbreaks and preparedness. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, it's really nice to meet all of you. Um, so yeah, my name is Shireen Gerges. I am a co-founder and director of a behavioral design company called Common Thread. Um, and basically we design um, behavioral interventions and strategies to promote better health around the world. Um, and so one of the things that we incorporate into our method at, Pub at Common Thread is, so, so you know, we like to say we, we always put people at the center of public health. Uh, public health is really, really complex and people are at the center of any any public health intervention requires people's cooperation requires people's compliance um, but they're often sort of uh, either forgotten or they're sort of an afterthought um, or they're perceived to be just really really complex and 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 an obstruction to be honest um, and so one of the things that we do at common thread is is really try to help people unpack and 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 disentangle why people make the decisions that they do why are they so seemingly irrational um, and uh, what what we do first at common thread is is literally we look for the common threads um, and and what we find across the world across all of the public health programs that we've worked in you know from ebola to polio to uh, avian influenza to H1N1 to now COVID-19 is that, um, you know, people are united by some pretty core and fundamental human values. Um, so we do a lot of work with childhood immunization, for example. And so no matter where people live, no matter where, uh, you know, what ethnicity or what background they are, you know, people always want the best for their children. They always want their children to be healthy. 
And throughout COVID-19, we've seen that principle, of course, apply and extend to people's families. They want their parents to be healthy. They want their community to be healthy. How they go about doing that um, differs, and that's where we see a lot of divergence. Um, but fundamentally, people want their health services to reflect the communities that they live in. They want their health service to reflect the values that they hold dear. Um, and they want to trust that their health care providers have their best interests at heart. So I think that's, that's always where we start. You know, that's the common ground and the foundation that we can leverage from. Um, so, so it's important to understand, you know, where to go from there. Um, but generally, I, I'd say those are some core fundamental human values that, that we find across the world. Um, but how do you leverage that? How do you tap into those um, core values? And that's where communication really needs to embrace and understand context. And context is so important with how we communicate and how we design behavioral interventions. So, you know, if we're designing messages or if we're communicating, it's really, really important to know who you're communicating to and what is the social, political, um, environmental context and, and the values that are um, primary in that context. So for example, you know, we've seen a lot of messaging and a lot of communication in the US around, uh, you know, we're all in this together. Um, and that had a tremendous amount of a backlash um, because people felt like we're not all in this together. Um, and, and the U.S., you know, one argument for why that might not have worked is that the U.S. is, is a very, like other, other Western democracies, is a very individualistic culture. And they place a lot of value on individual freedom over collective freedom, for example, whereas other uh, countries and contexts like um, like China or the, or Singapore or the Far East, where you you know their interventions relied on things like QR codes, for example, where uh, you know you were um, told when you could move, uh, when you were free to uh, go out, when you were free to um, you know when you needed to self isolate, and that had an enormous impact, I think, on um, curtailing the, the pandemic. Um, and, but those are two very different approaches. Um, to COVID-19, which will not work everywhere. You know, you can't just replicate that. You really have to understand, is our society collective? Is it individualistic? And what are the values that we're working with so that we can leverage those values, um, you know, in the best way possible? And so, you know, those are two examples. One is, you know, how do we communicate? And the other was, you could say, well, that wasn't communication. That was a, a different kind of intervention. And, and so my second point is everything is communication everything that we do in public health is communication. So communication is everything and everything is communication. The way that we design a service is communication. You know, so what does that tell people? Uh, what does it tell people if you're designing a service um, that's accessible to within a nine to five uh, timeframe? Or what does it communicate if you're designing um, a vaccine vial that is only written in a certain language for certain people who can understand it? Um, what are we telling people when a um, clinic is staffed with only men? You know, what are we telling women? Or what are we telling people when um, the ethnic makeup or the racial makeup of a clinic is, is, does not match their community makeup? So all of those things are ways that we communicate and ways that we're communicating value to people. Um, and I think, you know, public health doesn't always think of those things as communication. They think of communication as what are we saying in the media? Uh, what are we saying on social media? And one of the things that we really try to emphasize at Common Thread is sort of like the combination of those two things, uh, the combination of what we're saying, what we're doing, how we mix um, facts with stories. Uh, I'm sorry, Sarah, I missed uh, the, the majority of what you were saying, but I came in at the tail end when you were talking about stories and narratives and, and making things personal. and. Uh, we really, really believe that that is so important to, to you know, we say uh, narrative over numbers um, to really bring the, the, the personal and the, and the facts uh, together. So I'll, I'll sort of end there in a way, um, but just to say that that's sort of the philosophy of what we do, what we mean by behavioral design at Common Thread. We try to mix all of these different things into uh, a method of how we communicate about public health, which includes service delivery, which includes, you know, the environment that you're designing, 
Uh, it includes the understanding people and their values and their cultures, understanding common ground and leveraging that common ground. And, and the field has really grown over the last five years, even, you know, behavioral science has allowed us to be so much more systematic with how we understand these things. Uh, you know, I've been working in polio before Common Thread for um, 15 years, and, you know, we just didn't have the science uh, or the documented science that we have now to allow us to, to create such a systematic approach with how we communicate and how we design these things. So I think there's just an enormous amount um, that's happened throughout COVID. And I, I, I really hope that we continue to invest in, in this space and we continue to invest in research in understanding people. There's so much investment in the biomedical side, um, but so much less investment in the human side. Um, and I hope, I hope that COVID has taught us that that, that needs to change. Thanks so much. Um, well, I'm looking at common threads across the, <laughs> the different, different panelists here. And one of them is, um, as you raised, Shreen, is, is context, which um, Priya, just, to, just before you, had talked about gathering the context through, through mainstream media monitoring. Um, and I think, you know, the different points points you made are, are, are really um, important. And I love the communication is everything um, because sometimes I think, um, I don't know about you, but I would think probably the same, get a bit wary with the overemphasis on the message, on the message. Um, it is so much bigger than the message. And the, the message may be, as you say, who's in the room with you. Um, that sends a message. It could be in any many things. Um, and it gets back a little bit to what Priya was saying, too, about the um, the ideal versus the reality of one voice, which also implies one message. Um, and that just uh, doesn't work for a number of players because, um, you know, many of them have their own internal communications objectives and limitations of what they can say. So you, you want to have kind of a, a shared um, a goal, a aspiration, but how you get there and what the messages are. And actually, I think our publics these days don't trust it if too many people are singing off the same song page. It is too much um, choreographed. Somebody's up there pulling the str strings. In fact, you know, you can benefit from having a, a, a chorus of, of different voices and messages, but somehow um, towards the same um, ambition. So I just want to um, throw one question to um, all the panelists, um, because one of the things, as I mentioned, was about, about context that has come up and played a role, uh, even uh, just even in uh, Ben's first uh, three C's and in terms of, um, I have to remember them now, the closed spaces, the crowded spaces, the closed context and avoiding all that. Now, again, that's context very much, uh, human context, but what happens when context changes? And in the context of, of COVID, every day we wake up to different news, different epidemic contexts, different situational contexts, different opportunities for how we move. How do you deal with, in, in each of you, and I'll come back to Ben to kick off and uh, go around the table, but how how have you uh, seen is, is a good way or how have you managed the best in terms of trying to evolve uh, in how you communicate with this ever-changing context and um, and how we need to respond to it. Over to Ben. Yeah, it's tough. I, actually, with, with COVID, I think what we're seeing right now is quite a change in, in fortunes, where early on, Europe, North America were very heavily affected. A lot of infections, a lot of concern, a lot of lockdowns and social distancing. In Asia, where I am, in Hong Kong, we've actually done pretty well in the past year. The numbers of cases have been have been low. You remember China was really the first, had a lot of cases, but then after March or April 2020, really had hardly any, 
hardly any cases. And now they're not even in the top 10, the top 20 case counts in the world. Um, and so right now we've got a different situation where vaccines are now distributed in the West, uh, widely available in, in, in many countries anyway, not everywhere, but in many countries, vaccination rates are fairly high in Asia. Still, we're lagging a long way behind. We haven't had the vaccines so soon. Uh, in Hong Kong, where I am, we have about 20% uh, people have had their first dose. And there's a lot of hesitancy in other parts of Asia, even less, e even fewer people have had vaccines, a lot of hesitancy. And one of the reasons for the hesitancy is interesting. It's almost that we're victims of our own success, where we've done so well in minimizing the risk of COVID in the past year with the emergency measures that a lot of the public have this impression that COVID's not a threat. We haven't seen here in Asia what's happened in, in New York uh, in April of 2020 and in other parts of the world, in India more recently, uh, in the Far East anyway. We, we haven't seen those kind of scenarios. And so there's not that urgency to get vaccinated, a lot of hesitancy. And now it's actually a big challenge to persuade people that COVID is this risk. We can't keep the emergency measures going forever. People say, why not? Why can't we just stay like we are because we're happy like we are? Um, but it's not feasible to, to have quarantines, to have social distancing, face masks for, for years to come. And so that's a really tough challenge now in, in Asia is to communicate. We do need the vaccines if we're going to get back to normal. And how to overcome the hesitancy is something that, that we're really struggling with. Over. Yeah. Thanks. And I think that um, in a similar thing in terms of the success, trying to get people this these confusing messages, OK, you've gotten vaccinated, but still keep your mask on, at least for a while. Yep. <laughs> and I think people are ready. They need the motivation to be able to get rid of one thing if they're going to do another. Um, to Sarah. Yeah, sure. I think this challenge of... Um how to communicate information in a changing environment is like the challenge of COVID mm -hmm. uh, over the past year. And I think uh, thinking back over the past year, um, I, I did think of a phrase that has uh, frustrated me a lot that I would like to ban, which was the phrase, there is no evidence for. Um, and the reason I don't like this phrase is because it can mean two totally different things, right? It can mean there's no evidence for this because it is absolutely untrue. Uh, to give an absurd example, there's no evidence the vaccine will cause you to grow a third arm because you're not going to do that. Uh, but it can also be used to mean there's no evidence for something because we just haven't gathered the evidence for it yet. Mm -hmm. um, early on, this was there wasn't any evidence that masks work because we just hadn't literally done the large studies to um, to uh, collect the data that it worked. And then in the December, something I heard a lot is um, there's no evidence that vaccines uh, prevent transmission, um, just because we hadn't had, you know, done the work to collect the evidence that this is true. Um, but, but in both of these cases, like, right, like, we're not operating in, like, uh, perfect certainty and like no information. It's not a binary. We either know or we don't know something. Based on how we know what happens, you know, the way like droplets and aerosols work, we can make a pretty good um, uh, uh, infer infer inference that masks do work and do prevent transmission. And with the uh, vaccines themselves, right? Like we know how other vaccines have worked. We know a little bit about how the disease worked. Um, there's a pretty there's a pretty good chance, and I think you know the the data now is bearing it out that the vaccines reduce transmission as well. So I just think that this is just such a confusing phrase to people, and in some ways it's um it's an easy phrase to to kind of like fall back on because it's always going to be true even though it could be one of two very different things. Um, so I think, you know, as, as much as we can portray rather uh, instead of binaries to portray kind of like the true range of likely possibilities and the emphasis on likely um, based on prior knowledge, I think that can um, make, pe make people understand that uh, information is not all or nothing. It's not perfect certainty or we know nothing at all. Sometimes there's in between and we, the hard part is we have to make different, uh, we have to make decisions when information is imperfect. Um, I think another really, really big challenge for, for media, especially, has been um, this is in the environment of such evolving information, there is a genuine disagreement between experts sometimes on what something means before we really have the data. And I think sometimes, you know, some people can maybe be the loudest in the media or loudest in social media, and they are the people easiest to kind of find and quote, but that may not actually reflect the genuine consensus within the largest scientific community. So another thing we have to make sure to do is like just not to portray a consensus when, when there isn't one. Um, obviously, like, but uh, example in retrospect is the masking, right? I think early on in the US, uh, 
all, sort of most people in the U.S. are saying, no, masks don't work or we don't need masks. But if we had just kind of looked beyond our borders and, you know, talk to people in Asia, like there, there would have been a very different um, consensus there. So I think uh, we should, um, I think there's often an urge to simplify, which, which makes sense because it is very, very complicated. But, um, you know, people are smart and people, um, you know, when you kind of treat your audience as smart, they do rise to that occasion. We shouldn't try to simplify to the point where we convey things as, you know, uh, all or nothing, to, uh, even when they are not. Thanks. It, and this is, I mean, it's it's hyper uncertain and evolving now, but we we even have that in, quote, normal times. Um, and, and it's a tough one. Um, and I think science has a hard time saying without adding that um, that clause of as far as we know or <laughs> something. Um, over to Priya. Yeah, um, absolutely true. As far as we know, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's because we always work from the, the evidence we have, right? And we want to, to always stress that. Um, and, and that's how this sentence always comes in. But when we think in terms of context as um, regulators for vaccine safety, um, there are always two concepts which come first, and it's very numerical, is in fact, um, what is the exposure? So whatever we see, we put in the context of the exposure. And the second thing is, what would have happened without vaccination? Now, um, there are two, two comparisons here. The, 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 the regular comparison is, is, a, is, a, is a normal, healthy population without a pandemic. But then we also have, obviously, what would happen if, if the pandemic goes uncontrolled. So we have, um, so we work here from, from two comparators and that, that's, that, that's obviously different from what we normally um, see and have to communicate. But I think what there is more context, and that's maybe context which, which traditionally has not so much seen, but, but has been anticipated, as I have um, explained in our um, introductions already, is the context around the overall risk governance, the underpinning legislation, who is allowed to do what, um, who is overseeing companies, um, can, can industry just do what they want, or are they highly regulated? How do we inspect them? What standards do exist? Um, have any of these standards been jeopardized because of the speed of the vaccine development? Um, how do we actually manage our job where we normally took more time? Why can we actually do it now quicker? What kind of measures have we taken to, on one hand, um, deliver the same quality? And obviously there has been a lot of reshuffling of resources, um, uh, basically working in shifts, and, and, and that's how regulators at the moment uh, deliver. And um, so, so this is the, 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 the more sort of, um, yeah, the, the, con the organizational context we need, in fact. And, uh, and I think this is also a new, new experience for us to, to communicate on, on these uh, really organizational context, because before the organizations were just taken for granted, they are there, and now we are giving much more insight in, in how we operate. Um, I think what, why we want to provide context is because we want to, to change data into evidence which has meaning. And, and Sarah has been talking a lot about meaning and I, I like that and how to, to create um, meaningfulness for people and, and different interpretations then come up with different meanings. And I think this is, this, is um, uh, this challenge we try to overcome by giving more insight into the decision-making. But um, I'm not, I think this is the, the main area we currently have to work on. And to come back to your question, really, it was nicely how you, how you phrased it. Um, uh, Heidi, you said, what happens if the context changes? Now, the thing is, um, do we actually understand always the changing context? Or um, so, so what do we do in terms of monitoring the changing context? And I think we have to accept that um, we not all our preparedness plans uh, will be um, uh, will be complete. So, so we have to be flexible and also adapt to the changing context. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I, I think that that's a really <laughs> important point about. Um, it's not just, 
we have to actually make that effort to to watch and be aware of the changing context kind of situation awareness i guess and um and work it into our uh what we're seeing um and that that changing context um is highly variable also as we've seen even within one population you can have a lot of different things going on so um shireen yeah, this thanks. Fascinating topic. <laughs> How do you yeah. find the common thread in all this? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's context, right? Like everybody's had a different take on context and and what what context means. And I, I think that it's so important as health professionals. Um, you know, we have a responsibility to give the health context, right? And and so like as people, uh, you know, generally humans have something that behavioral scientists would call a numeracy bias. Like we're terrible at making sense of numbers and data in a vacuum. And the one thing that's happened throughout this pandemic is there's just an abundance of numbers and figures uh, that are thrown at us every day without any context, without any relative kind of explanation of what those numbers mean. And on their own in a vacuum, they're incredibly scary. Uh, and so our, our first instinct is to say, well, that's a really scary statistic, you know, even if it's one in 400,000 or one in 100,000. Um, but when we're, th we're being thrown all these numbers uh, without any interpretation or without any context, um, I think people's response is that the science is flawed. People don't know what they're doing. And um, I'm, I'm not going to take anything that they that they tell me. But, you know, if we were to explain the context, which is that, you know, how are vaccines introduced generally? Vaccines are introduced um, in this way every single time we have a new vaccine. And the fact that there are side effects that are being um, identified, that that's normal. That happens all the time. And that just means that the system is working, right? And it just so happens that in, in COVID, these vaccines are being rolled out under an enormous global spotlight. Um, but this is not outside the ordinary, uh, you know, turn of events that these side effects are identified, they're investigated, and then they're responded to. Um, or for example, the risk of, of blood clots, you know, that was communicated in a way that suggested this was an extreme risk, you know, but what we don't say is that, you know, women, for example, face the same risk uh, when they take um, birth control, that they also have a one in 1000 chance of having a blood clot, um, or that we have, you know, we face this, you know, similar risks of um, having a car accident or, you know, other things like that, that we do every day without thinking about it. Um, because I think we're not explained, uh, first of all, how, like how, the basics of health literacy, you know, like how do vaccines generally work? What is the risk benefit calculation that we take anytime we take any medical intervention, like a vaccine or a medication or anything, and then putting, you know, vaccination in that kind of similar context, um, I think would do, would do a lot for people. Um, so I think, I think, those are just some some suggestions, but I think it has been really difficult to think of all the various angles to explain context. There's just so many ways you can slice context and it's it's complex. I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, I. I was put on the spot a few times in some interviews about the when the risks started started happening and um, I think the the challenge of saying something like um, the system is working and this is normal, um, it's normal for science, but for a person who's affected, they feel really dismissed when you say it's normal, like it's normal for one of you to. So I think this tension between trying to recognize the it's only one in a million but and the but what if that one is me or my family or um and it and it's hard and i think it's um this going back and forth from the the macro to the micro as i think we've all touched on or you've all touched on in in different ways 
Um, we have 10 minutes left on this session and, and I, I just want to do one, one more round. Um, and please feel free to throw in other things that you might want to say in this last round that you haven't had a chance to. But we've been talking a lot about, well, people talk a lot about the COVID vaccine or vaccines. But the reality is there we have we have more coming down the pipeline and and we see that now I mean we didn't even know if we had one vaccine and and it's actually a miracle that we had within a year what we've what we has been achieved scientifically um, but when you do have a portfolio of vaccines and they're all different and some have more or less risks than others and they have all kinds of different needs how how do we play that out and also uh in the particular case of some having more efficacy and who gets what uh and i think it also touches on the issue of of equity um uh because that's that's a big issue um then if we're talking about asia but i think the other big challenge um right now is africa uh, that has barely gotten any vaccines. There's been some bilateral agreements, but with the situation in India, it's been hard to get vaccines there. And then anxieties about um, the blood clot risks have, you know, and then in the beginning, some didn't work against the South African variant. So it's a very, and the whole vaccination effort has not really, is just picking up in different ways across the continent. And that's a that's a challenge we have right now, and I have to say there's been a, a huge ground up effort um, uh, that is is really impressive there. Um, but how do we? Um, I would love to hear all of your comments. Um, in okay, how do we navigate the fact that these are all different? Oh, same ultimate objective is to. <laughs> Um, prevent COVID, but in different ways with different risks. Why don't I circle back to Ben and then do the round table? Yeah, that, uh, maybe a couple of points. I think it, it confuses people when on one hand we say, get whichever vaccine you can at the first available opportunity. And they're all, the, they're all good vaccines. And then on the other hand, there's always a lot of media coverage about the exact percentage points in the latest study that's come out of this country or that country. And we know they're not exactly the same. We still couldn't say in the longer term, which one is better to get now, which one you know, might, might have longer protection or broader protection, because we just don't have the evidence. It's not that, that we, we have evidence that they're the same. We just, we're just still collecting a lot of evidence. And one thing that slightly concerns me is when the, the chief executives of the big companies, like the Pfizer chief executive, announces to everybody that we're all going to need annual vaccination with, with his company's vaccine. And I think that doesn't help. But certainly in Asia, we're thinking about we haven't even got around the first round of vaccinations and we're already thinking that we're going to need it again. Why don't we just wait for six months and then we wouldn't need that one next year because that will be the one we get in six months time. So talking about boosters so soon, I don't think is helpful. And there must be vested interests in terms of who's going to be uh, the, the keenest to to be distributing booster doses. Um, and then the last point is is about the issue of vaccinating children. I know it's a hot topic in the US right now. And and I know that, that uh, Tedros, Dr. Tedros just said that uh, we shouldn't really be vaccinating children when so many parts of the world, like Africa, can't even get hold of vaccines at all. And we know children are not that vulnerable. And I tend to agree that, that uh, the priority now should be getting vaccines to the vulnerable people, healthcare workers around the world before we start thinking about vaccinating children. Thanks. Yeah, the children issue has been, um, it's, uh, do we do it because now we know we can, or is that the right thing to do? <laughs> um, over to Sarah. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on something Ben said, which is uh, how do we make sense of all these stories in the media all the time about the new variants in the vaccine and this variant against that vaccine and um, the blood clot risks. And I, I think um, just to kind of give a little bit of insight about how, how journalism thinks and like why these stories exist is just that um, 
this might be helpful to talk about bias in journalism. And I don't necessarily mean like political bias, but um, kind of the bias that's built into journalism, which is a bias for novelty and what's new and what's interesting, right? Um, I think I've sometimes heard journalism compared to like fast anthropology or anthropology um, being slow journalism. Apologies to anthropologists out there. Um, but I think what's different is that anthropologists are often looking for like a representative example, whereas journalists are often very interested in like what's unusual, unexpected, what's surprising. And I think, you know, all these new variants, all these new uh, blood harvests are those. That's a reason why that those are stories. And if um, if someone goes get a vaccine, everything goes as normal. They don't have any side effects they don't get COVID like that's not a new story even though that is in fact they're going to be the experience of uh, most people who get a vaccine so I think there are probably creative ways that we can think about how to portray what is a typical experience rather than always talking about the, the you know the edge cases which are interesting and we, we have to report on them right because um if, if you know if someone who is maybe a little, a little skeptical of vaccines says well why is the news media never reporting on anything negative for vaccines like that's that's like a very easy way to lose trust um, but i think i am like very aware of the way that like uh, just like kind of new new things become the things that capture our attention and um one of the i guess uh privileges of working at a place like the atlantic uh, magazine rather than a newspaper is that i am not covering the the news every day i can kind of take a step back and think about you know what is the importance in the bigger context so i think um helping uh, readers make sense of the the torrent of news not telling them every single you know not necessarily like going off of like this is kind of larger ecosystem in in, in um journalism but you know i think my role is kind of contextualizing the news rather than just giving you the new headline every day Yeah, I think that's um, that's a really important point. Just in terms of again, there's no one media, but different different types. That some are more news. Well, everyone wants novelty in a sense. I mean, all are aspiring to some new angles, but um, you have the advantage of more in in reflective. Um, uh, Priya. Yeah, thank you for for this question. I mean. Obviously, there, it's, it's really a remarkable success of science and technology that we have um, so many vaccines so quickly available. And how we deal with this, obviously, at regulatory level, we do what we can do best, which is collect data and collect more data, assess and, and, and be in a constant uh, benefit risk management cycle. What is um, uh, obviously to, to convey in terms of communication is that uh, various products will be in various parts of their life cycle. So there will be different evidence bases and we have to somehow communicate that absence of evidence and evidence of absence is not the same thing. But as, 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 as evidence accumulates over time, um, the, the risk benefit profiles have different maturity. And that is something which so far we are not uh, never um, forced to, to communicate uh, in such a way as we have now. So that's also a very new experience for us. Um, and then also to see what could be genetic factors, risk factors um, for, for certain adverse reactions. Um, as a tool, we have um, in, in, in all the, the stringent regulator authorities, they have some type of, of risk management planning with ongoing studies, and some of them are quicker um, and some take longer. And for some patients, that's obviously then not easy to handle because if they have a specific disease and want to wait, then um, these results will not be available so quickly. But I would like to come back also to something broader. Um, um, obviously, while the regulators uh, around the world uh, check the, the vaccines uh, for, for benefit and risk profiles, it will be, again, others, as we said in the beginning, who make the, the decisions on, on the vaccination policy and the prioritization and, and who gets vaccinated, where, how. Um, and I think we should also positively frame that there is a system of checks and balances. I mean, because not everything is in one hand uh, and we have public health agencies, we have um, regulatory agencies, they're, they're, that's also um, part of, of, of a system, a governance system, which in a way um, is, is, is trustworthy in itself because um, uh, multiple, multiple expertise and, and perspectives are involved I think one final thing I wanted to say is that the, the infodemic um, 
is, I think, is here to stay, even if we hopefully overcome the pandemic. I think um, there will be a long shadow cast um, with uh, whatever is happening at the moment in the information environment. And, uh, and in order, as, as, as this event is about getting ready for the future, I think it will be a lot about how can we consistently demonstrate the confidence in the system that is there, the, the trustworthiness of the system, so that um, the investment is now for the future. So we have to do our best now, and, and that will um, hopefully um, uh, give the, the, the confidence of the people that um, the system is, is robust in itself and, uh, and is committed. Thanks so much, and, and I agree on the infodemic is here to stay, uh, and our challenge is to get a better balance of the good amount of information versus the, the incorrect. Um, Shireen, you've got the last few minutes here to um, add your, your view, and we'll wrap up. Great, thank you. It's a lot of pressure. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think what's so extraordinary about COVID-19 is that, you know, I, I can't think of another outbreak that we've had where there has been such nuance and such detail in the medical intervention that are communicated by the, the mass media or what we would traditionally call the mass media. Um, you know, generally in, in public health outbreaks, you would sort of, um, leverage mass media for like big messages, you know, the, the big sort of behavior that you want people to do, which in this case would be get the vaccine. Um, but you would leave the sort of nuance of that message, you know, which vaccine to take to more localized, more segmented, more tailored communication. So like your family doctor, for example. And so, you know, a, a traditional sequence would be, you know, the, the media would say there's a vaccine, it's great you know, go get it, talk to your family doctor about it. And you'd talk to your family doctor or, or somebody else that you trust. And they would say, well, here's your four options, you know, for your particular circumstance, we would recommend this vaccine. Um, that entire conversation has been now sort of elevated to a, a public conversation. Um, and on one hand, it's really transparent and everybody has a lot of information, but on the other hand, it's overwhelming and people can't really distinguish between, you know, that level of detailed medical information that they are left sort of to their own uh, own devices to make sense of. Um, and so I would say, you know, an ideal scenario would be that the, the big message that we give to everybody is, is take the vaccine, but that's going to be really different in your context. And you can't expect people to just take whatever, um, vaccine is available because for some people they do only have one vaccine available and that's great but for other people they do have a choice of four and five four or five vaccines and it's it's really unrealistic i think to say just disregard that choice you know we're, we're giving you all this dif this information but just you know don't worry about it um you know one vaccine may have 98 percent efficacy and one may have 85 percent efficacy but they're all just as good you know like people just don't don't work that way. Um, so I think we've we've sort of uh, created this um, cacophony in a way of messages that people, you know, ha are having a hard time disentangling. So I would say one one way we can try to remedy that is just kind of pulling pulling apart what what tools to use in which context. And, and mass media and social media are great; they have their advantages, but probably distinguishing the nuances of every single vaccine and every single intervention at a, at a very national and global level is, uh, you know, may not be, may not be its biggest strength. Thanks, Shireen. And I, I would just add that there are also settings that have no vaccines. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of our big priorities right now in the world is to try to make sure everyone has at least one type of vaccine available. Uh, thanks so much. I mean, you've been a fantastic panel. You've um, bringing a lot of different perspectives and um, got me certainly thinking about a number of new new angles. 